Welcome back. Recent studies show that the average person will spend around 122,400 hours at work over their lifetime. Oh, sounds crazy. How can we manage to stay sane during all those long work hours in the office? Here with the answers to our workplace dilemmas is author of The You Plan, Dr. Michael Woody. Dr. Woody, thanks so much for being here. It's great to be here. So what are some of the biggest issues that we deal with in the workplace? The things that are driving us right. all crazy. It's always bad bosses. Yeah. And don't Stanford, just take my word for it. Yeah, I know, right? Yes. And don't just take my word for it. According <clears throat> to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, not having someone who's a collaborative boss or someone who works with you has been the number one complaint for four years in a row. So it's having those conversations with bosses at work. That's the big killer. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I, okay, let's pretend I'm in a situation with someone <laughs> who will remain unnamed Sanford. Um, and he's not we're collaborating. Pretending. We're pretending. If he weren't collaborating with me, what kind of a dialogue should I initiate to get him to be more playful? And well, you know, one of the things is that it causes stress at work when you're not having a conversation. Right. So, you know, stress is really about perceived lack of control. When you feel like you don't have control over a situation, just like you're sitting in a car and you right. can't move and you're honking because you think it creates control. The same thing is with the boss. If you're not talking about what's going on, or you're not confronting that situation or issue, you're going to feel out of control. So the first thing you want to do is, but first you have to acknowledge well, the fact you're stressed. But, but okay, just, uh, I, this is making me think about this. If I okay. confronted my boss, mm -hmm. certain bosses might just fire me. So it's not always so right. easy to just walk up and say, you're not really communicating well with me, or I think you're an, a right. mean person. Yeah. Might, that might get you out of a job. And, well, and we could drag your bosses out there and get them on <laughs> camera so, we can, so you don't get fired. But no, here's the thing. It, you have to own the problem, right? I always say you got to kind of name the puppy if you want to own it. So first of all, you have to acknowledge that there is an issue or stress or something that's not being talked about. The next thing to do is have the conversation, but you don't have to be confrontational, right? It's kind of find a way to slide into having that conversation. Okay. You need to bring it up because it's on you if they're not bringing it up. And let's face it, most bosses aren't great at being a boss hmm. and uh, it's the, it's the <laughs> fact because in in American life in our business world what we do is we promote our star players to coaches without helping them train them or because they know understand. how to play they might not know how to manage right okay and so sometimes you have to help train your boss and sometimes they're afraid to have a conversation too it's you know it's conflict oriented we like to avoid that so well, what are some of the keys because all right. of us are in a hierarchy of, of a workplace. Right. So even while we may have a boss, we may be in charge of some other people. So what are right. the things that we, what, what makes a good boss or a good leader in that situation? Someone who listens first and mm -hmm. shoots questions later. So the idea is understand what's going on with your people. And you always have to have your finger on the pulse of the organization and the team. Mm -hmm. You've got to know what they're saying and what they're feeling. Because you know, you open this up with most people spend most of their waking hours working. And so we want to create an environment that's healthy, that's more relaxed. And the only way you do that is, first of all, talking about the white elephant in the middle of the room that right. everyone's walking around and ignoring. So I think what makes a great boss is someone who's willing to listen here and is willing to ask for feedback. How am I doing? Well, that works in every relationship, really. Absolutely. <clears throat> with your families, with your friends. Right, right. Listening and being open and to and receptive to what you hear is is always the first step to improving any relationship. Because yeah, because here's the fact: we're all victims of living in our own heads, mm -hmm. right? So we'll yeah. negative self-talk. We'll have a conversation with someone even though they're not there, right? And we'll think we can anticipate what they're going to say, and then what happens is we don't actually have the real conversation with that person. Yeah. So that negative self-talk, it's almost like an autoimmune disease. Your mind just attacks itself and makes it worse, and the problem festers. And we don't treat something like a wound; it gets worse. So that's why it's important to make sure that both as a boss and as an employee, you're, you're open to having dialogue. Right. And you're okay with hearing some feedback that may not be what you want to hear, right. but don't push back or be defensive. Just listen, think about it. <laughs> and what luck. can you do with it? <coughs> you right. Know? right, right, right. Um, for most of us, our greatest source of stress, is if we're healthy and everything's okay, mm -hmm. we have continuous daily stress. At, in the workplace, even right. if we have a nice boss. Mm -hmm. How do we cope with that? Well, one of the things is we, you have to remember, if you're unsatisfied at your job, yeah. you're 63% more likely to have stress at that job. Okay. So if you're not happy, that's going to lead to stress. You have to look at a couple things. One, are you in an environment that's healthy? Mm -hmm. If you're in an environment that is not the right fit for you, whether it's the culture, the values, the style of management, you're not going to really be able to change that. 
and it's important to acknowledge that. So you should quit. <laughs> well, you have to think about. <laughs> sometimes you should think about an exit strategy or going. It's not to a, a good place time to better. quit right now. If you've you know, got a job, you should be happy. You've got a job. First of all, I don't buy that. There really? are far more jobs out there than people realize. But here it is. At the end of the day, especially if you're in a situation where you may have been laid off, it's an opportunity to think about where do you want to go next because. Do you want to stay in an unhealthy, negative, bad environment? Because mm -hmm. what it does to your health, what it does to your relationships, are you willing to hang on to that or are you okay with thinking about taking a look out there? And I'll tell you, a salary.com survey recently found that 77% of Americans are actively looking for a new job. Even while they're in their last job. Even, even <laughs> in their current job and even as bad as the economy may be because people are unhappy. So say you're stuck in your job and, mm -hmm. you, and, <coughs> excuse me, and you need to put food on the table. Sure. How do you make that stressful job better? Well, it's all about, first of all, it's a couple things. One is, like I said, you have to acknowledge what's going on. What are the problems, what are the challenges you're dealing with? And second, you have to think about what part of the problem are you? Right, yeah, yeah. There it's are some easy people, to blame other people. Of course, and yeah. it's natural to point the finger. There are some people that are gonna be unhappy no matter where they are, what time of day it is, they're just naturally always unhappy. So you have to look at yourself and say, how much of this stress is on me. Mm -hmm. How much am I creating for myself? How much is it my ne negative self-talk? Even if you're only 2% of the problem, deal with that 2% first. Okay. Then start thinking about the external factors around you because sometimes it's how you view the world right. or how you react or respond to people. And especially if you're around a lot of negative people, try to pull away if you can and focus on your strengths and where your energy is gonna be positive, right. not negative. And then, of course, the second thing is if you really are thinking about moving on and it's a bad place to be, start planning an exit strategy. You don't just up and quit. Right. Think about what are ways to start exploring and being introspective. I'm the preachy psychologist, right, right, but right. it starts by looking inward first. So if we have stress and work and we're not leaving and we've done the work on ourselves, yeah, yeah. we still need to decompress when we get home. Sure. Can you give us a few tips of just to the way to get rid of stress once we walk out of the office and are back in our houses? First of all, any kind of physical activity is important because you know, when you build that stress up, you gotta let it out physically somehow. Mm -hmm. If you don't, your body attacks itself, right? Yeah. So you have the cortisol and all these things going on and the adrenaline, so when you get home, I think you should have a routine of exercise and physical fitness do things because not only does it help get that stress out, right. it also will make you feel better and it'll make you a little bit more bearable to your family when you go back and see them. But also, I'm a big believer in uh, mindful meditation, relaxation and breathing techniques. These are things just to help settle you and center you. But at the end of the day, I'm not a big believer in work-life balance. It's really work-life blend. And so we're digitally connected all the time. And so you have to set boundaries for yourself. Yeah. So it's not always unwinding. It's when you get home, put down your phone. Unplugging. Unplug it yeah. and set time periods where you're unplugged because it's amazing when you know that it can't ring, that stressor's gone. Thank you so much. Great advice. <laughs> Welcome back. All of my guests today have one very special thing in common. They've all pursued their passions. And now Brooke Seiler, Dr. Woody, and John Sally <laughs> are all back to talk about how they found their passion. So let's talk passion. Yeah. Really passion. <laughs> passion. I mean, I, some of it's luck and the rest is really just listening to your gut. When you're around people that you like to be around, when you're doing something that feels great for you, you have to keep following that. And I think our heads are always telling us to, to do something that makes sense. But if you really just stop for a second and check in, you know what feels right and what doesn't feel right. Yeah. I mean, I, you were talking about well, I, Yeah, I kind of stumbled into my passion because I had a crazy girlfriend in high school. <laughs> and so in my <laughs> feeble attempt to understand women, I thought I would pursue psychology. Uh -huh. uh, okay. And then Good I found that, that that really, you know, therapy <laughs> wasn't quite my thing. So I uh, ended up finding more about workplace psychology and how people could, how I could help people there. Um, but you know that still, I still haven't figured women out. So but that part like of my help. passion didn't. didn't but really you help. help. You like helping people. I love it absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have a different passion. My <laughs> passion, I, they change every ten years. Oh. I get passionate about something else. Oh. Um, You're a fickle passion. Well, no, I'm 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 a searcher. <laughs> I would say for more for, right. for for loving of life. And I had a passion to be a professional ball player. And then when I got that, I had a different passion for photography. Then I have a passion for food. And I have a passion for wine. 
I've never lost my passion for women. <laughs> uh, that's that's never going years. in it. But it does change every 10 years. Oh, you guys no. get... But you have a common theme, though. Right. When you think about it, right, you have a passion for life, and these are all exactly. way of manifesting loving life. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's kind of a theme that you And you, you also follow. do it fully. You don't right. dabble. You're that's not... I mean, a lot of guys love basketball, right. but what you did was totally different. I was going to say, I think once you're successful at one thing, it gives... It kind of opens your eyes to you could really do anything. And I don't think a lot of people hit that point where they're successful at something the first time so that they know really the, the world's your oyster. Well, you know, that's a really good point because so many people enjoy things and, and say they're passionate about something, but the, they hit the first obstacle and it's over. Right. And they move on or they forget right. about it or they turn on the television. So how do you, what's your advice for overcoming obstacles in well, order to get on that path of passion? Oh, no. Do there or is do not. <laughs> there is There's no try. try. I, that, that Yoda mentality <laughs> yeah. is when people go into something and I tell, like when they're raising kids and I've raised uh, my children, uh, I tell them I don't get in their way. You don't stop the butterfly from trying to get out of the cocoon because that's where you build a strength. Now we talked about like this, this time in life that everybody's so sensitive and, so, and everything is so politically correct. I don't agree with all that. I believe you're supposed to run into hardships because that teaches you how to deal with life. And be okay with taking lessons from the hardships. Right. Like John right. said, it's, mm -hmm. a, it, it's a learning experience and it makes you richer as a person sure. and I think more better equipped to deal with those challenges you go through. If you can get through that first hurdle, then you get to the and next you get one. Confidence. Then, you build yeah, confidence. you build that confidence and feel better about it. And, you know, I'm a big believer, and I sound like the preachy psychologist, but, but he's you are. Be who you but are. It, it is be who you are. <laughs> but it, it's looking inward. Um, and I think you have to look inward first to really dig in and find, like, do you have that passion for life? Right. Or do you have that passion to play ball? And are you really willing to take it? to that next level and really push hard because sometimes I think passions can be fleeting too. Right. We get excited about something or it seems like a hobby and then are you really that into it? You really have to test yourself and I think test it with your friends around you too. Well you guys are all really fortunate in that you mm -hmm. love what you do professionally. Love. You are passionate about your jobs mm -hmm. and it, it comes across. You can see it. Yeah. What other sorts of things, you said women, <laughs> we got yeah. that one. <laughs> what other sorts of things outside of work because some people you know they just have a daily grind and they're not going to love Working yeah. on an assembly mm -hmm. line the way that you love basketball, you love psychology, or mm -hmm. you love Pilates. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm you were soon too. And okay. inflicting pain, yeah. apparently, yeah, yeah. yeah. part of the passion. A little bit. So, what do you guys love outside of your work? Where, do, where does that passion come through in your day to day lives? Definitely my family. Yeah. I mean, it's family, definitely. Interpersonal relationships, working on that, and starting to recognize almost, you know, I have a large family, I'm the youngest of six, and starting to see like where we could work together. I think taking things that you like, uh, most people think, well, I don't think I can make something out of this, but if you mm -hmm. just, again, find what you love. I, I was talking with my brother who's trying to get a company off the ground, and I'm really interested in him. He's teaching children. And I thought, I really, I'm into that, and I know I'm a teacher, and maybe I can help him. So that's combining my love of family and my love of teaching. And I think if you can start just keep rolling with what you already know you like. Yeah. I think sometimes it's good to just know what you don't like. If you know you don't mm. like uh, something, just stay away from that's that. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to tell you. I, I, when I talk to people, I say, and I, I said this too, what, tell me what you don't like, because right. then I won't do that. Right. And then if all of a sudden you come back and have a conversation with me, like, well, I didn't like that. I said, well, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I said, so tell me, let me get past all your insecurities and all that part. And, and same thing with what I do with passion. When you're saying, what do I find? Pa I find passion in photography mm -hmm. because I can see different things. It's one of the only times, or the only time, that you can capture a second and it can stay that mm. second because yeah. time is constantly going. So I'm passionate about photography. I got my daughter Tyler into it. Uh, my little daughter Taya literally shoots everything because iPads are part of her world now. <laughs> right. So I just, as she said, trying to do it and pushing forward, that's what I look forward to when I'm not doing the things I have to do to make money. And then I started making money at things that's I was passionate right. about, yeah. which made it 10 times more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and to me, it's not too narrowly defining what passion is, because sometimes I think we can get focused on something very specific that I'm excited about. Like for me, it was more about the world of psychology and understanding how to relate to people and how to get them to connect and understand each other, mm -hmm. not just being a therapist, because then I would have kind of felt like I failed, you know, but like initially wanting to be a therapist, then realizing that that's not the place for me, because right. <laughs> people uh, listen to me, it wouldn't be good. Like, so, that make you but, feel? But, yeah, exactly, and I'm like, I really don't care, you know. But, so, but what I found is, though, is the larger field, and I found other parts in that field where I can funnel my energy towards 
helping people in a different way than just a therapeutic yeah, way, but yeah. in a way of making the workplace better and right. making your interactions more healthy and you fun. So niche. yeah, you find your niche, but you yeah. have to be open to it and yeah. be willing to look around yeah. you and not be too wed to something specific right off the bat, at least. Well, one of the things I've noticed about all of your passions is that it's it's good for you. It makes you grow as a person, and it also connects you to other people. Because I could say I'm passionate about eating Cheetos. I mean, that would have, <laughs> right. I could just sit home and eat Cheetos. Not, not Cheetos, no. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Veggios. You can eat what you want. Just as long as you drink some vegan vine with it. It doesn't have Cheetos. You yeah. have some wine. You, know, you have vegan vine, you got your vegan But you know, I, would, I don't think <laughs> sitting around drinking my vegan wine all day, vegan vine, would be a good passion either. I do. So there's, yes. <laughs> I but think drinking wine is a passion. I mean, I was watching you interview. contribution for some what you're passionate about or some way that you grow as a person or you share yourself with others. Because okay. if you're sitting around drinking wine all day, I don't think you're growing. Well, well, you're going to forget what somewhere. your passions are if you're <laughs> drinking <laughs> wine all day, so I don't think it'll be good for you. I, I mean, I, this is the difference, is, <laughs> as I realize, and, and everyone thinks that they have to do something that literally benefits everybody else. I think mm -hmm. if you do the best you can possibly be, or be the best person you can possibly be, that benefits it everyone well, no, else. Well, no, I, I agree. Right. But, um, but, but, you know, so skateboarding, you don't see the d direct benefit of betting other people, but it's entertaining. It's I think it's great. And it makes you, as I said, you, you you have to grow or you have to help other people grow. It's not just yeah. being, you know, being I look at Florence way. Nightingale. How about this? <laughs> How about you're a skateboarder, but you're a terrible driver, you're doing us all a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't know you were into skateboarding, so this is an I am a skateboard? terrible skateboarder. I'm a good driver, a terrible skateboarder, so I'm a really good driver. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I said that. This girl who mm. got in an accident one time said, I'm a really good driver. I can't believe this happened. Don't you think also <laughs> you have to know what you're, what you're not good at when you do it? I mean, the thing is, you know, you're a great interviewer. I was watching you before. You really listened. Yeah, but I wanted to be a supermodel. And uh, <laughs> That was so not Wait, happening. But you know what? That gets into also work. being realistic, it though. Work. Exactly. I mean, like, for me to have a passion and want to be in the NBA, it probably wouldn't have been in the cards for me, right? But, well, no. it, yeah, it's, this know. is deceiving, I mean, by last, the way. Last, last <laughs> Lisa, you're not word. A yeah. <laughs> oh, he's good. He's a flirt. Right. I just want one little piece of advice for somebody that is watching to get them engaged and following their passion really quickly. What do you tell them? Uh, go with what you feel, not with what you're thinking. Love it. Start by looking inward. Yes, beautiful. That's kind of, yeah. Do yeah. you. Do, do me. Do you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll get to that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's the next segment. Do you. Do you. <laughs> <laughs>